Thank you for that intro. I'm David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and Security First IT. And joining me, what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Oh my God, what was that? I, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a foghorn. <laughs> I know. My computer is like farting or something. <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me with HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. Hey, y'all. This is Tyler Watson with Specialty Orthopedics in Gainesville, Georgia, and you are listening to the Help Me with HIPAA podcast. Thank you for the intro. I'm David Sims of Security First IT and HIPAA for MSPs, and joining me is Donna Grindle from Carden, I think. (laughs) (laughs) So we are fighting all kind of technology issues this morning. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I started the morning with the power going out. (laughs) And, uh, you know, just gave up on rushing to record with David because without power, you know, just, yeah. you know. When there's no power, there's no responsibility. I know. <laughs> I started to text you and go, so how's that gigabit speed doing now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got to get some of them little battery backup things just so I can have the internet going. You know, just it's enough to just run the internet connection. I've got backup batteries for my phone. I could function. <laughs> I, that's what I'm going to work on next. I got, yeah. I saw some on Kickstarter that are pretty cool. I'm going to jump on that. Yeah. But when, yeah, when your power goes down, especially when you have a, a, a not normal home network like you and I do, <laughs> <laughs> when it comes back up, it's like, oh Lord, I've got to, you know, Typically, I have to boot things in a certain order or, or uh, things go crazy. It's yeah. funny because when my, if I have internet issues and the, and the ISP sends the tech out, they're looking at my stuff and they're like, what in the world? <laughs> I know. I just say to the, uh, really, with I, if I have a problem, I just take them right to where the fiber patches in mm-hmm. to the Ethernet and the router. And then everything after that, I'll worry about. You worry about that part, right? That's I know. it. I tell you, the the last time I had a problem, the the guy came in and he started messing around with stuff, and then he gets on the phone, and and, uh, and next thing I know, another guy shows up, and I was like, uh, "So it takes two of you?" And he's like, "Well, I'm from the business department side, so <laughs> it's like <laughs> he has no idea what kind of equipment you have in here because it's all business grade networking equipment." Yeah. 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 Uh, I was like, I don't need y'all to touch that. I just need you to fix my internet. <laughs> but uh, That's it. Yeah. Just One, leave this on. Do that. A few years ago, I had a, a Linux router set up, and it was just yes. on a normal PC, you know, box, but it was a Linux router. And <laughs> had the guy come out, he argued with me <laughs> that I didn't have a router. <laughs> I was like, no, the, that's the router there. No, that's a PC. I'm like, no, that's the router. I, know, I love it when they argue with you and tell you you can't do things that you've done for 15, 20 years. Mm-hmm. You can't yeah. do that. Yeah, Blanche, mm-hmm. I can. So anyway, yeah. so that's our trials and tribulations. And then David's computer started with a foghorn for no apparent reason. So we don't know what's going to happen as we cover this. So no telling. No yeah, telling. Hopefully it's but settled down now. I- interestingly enough, the topic of our show today is uh, <laughs> new tactical crisis response guide. <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah. um, you know, that's that's what we've been doing all morning. It's been definitely tactical crisis response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, handle it in a very small practice run. Yeah. So, mm. uh, you know, yesterday, uh, Donna and I in separate parts of the world, <laughs> we were, uh, you know, we get all these notifications from LinkedIn and Twitter and all this other stuff, but got a notification yesterday and um, uh, our good friend, Eric Decker, him and his crew had put together a, uh, a new piece of uh, documentation. And uh, it's like immediately when, it, when he posted like, hey, here's this new thing. I was like, awesome. <laughs> we will definitely be talking about this on the podcast soon. Yeah. 
I, I had know already it seen it and captured it and started reading it for the recording today. So, yep. Yeah. We we're on the same page. Hey, that that's cool. Yeah, that's yeah, not not always a thing, but <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, today we're going to go through the guide that I messaged him about just yesterday. So that's quick quick turnaround there. Yeah, it's still two weeks before it comes out though. So <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, that's it. But yeah. it's got some great stuff, and uh, and yeah, well, you'll see when we get there. But I personally can't say enough about the fact that the folks that are in the middle of all of this stuff take the time to write these things down and say, these are the things you should be considering mm -hmm. for when this happens. So thanks yeah, well, guys. Appreciate it. Let's, uh, let's see if we can start using some of this stuff that's freely available. <laughs> it costs too much. It costs too much to do this free stuff. Yeah, it does. Well, the inter interesting thing is that we have been talking about, and actually in the last episode, I think it ended with us talking about, you know, having response plan updates and going through all that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, we said it was the most important thing you needed to remember to do in that whole checklist of checklist discussion that we had. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, Eric Decker being a avid listener of the podcast says we need to get on something. So he <laughs> calls the hit group together and says, all right, guys, this is what we need. <laughs> the, the people that it helped me with him and need this guide. And so they went into action. They spit out this crisis response plan. And we thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. <laughs> First business, the 2020 COVID session of the HIPAA boot camp. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, completely online. So I guess we're going to call it the online version, the virtual version. I, I don't know what we're going to call it. Online version. It's, uh, it's uh, what do they call in it? Your, let's a do the attend, attend in your underwear version. <laughs> no, camera's <laughs> got to be on. No. Well, just a, don't stand up. <laughs> a digital conference. There you go. I think that's that's what we may have to call it, a I digital did, conference. I do have a, a friend of my wife who did a funny video on Facebook, and he was standing there talking. Uh, and he was like outside camping. And he's standing there talking, and after he finished talking, he turned around and walks off, and he's got underwear on. <laughs> it was hilarious. I have to find it and send it to you. That's <laughs> great. That's great. Uh, so anyway, uh, the 2020 COVID sessions, uh, August 18, 19, 20, uh, will be online. No travel required, right? No travel, no exposure. <laughs> yeah, well, at least not to COVID. <laughs> we no. might expose you to some stuff. Right, but keep in mind mm -hmm. this is not going. It's not going to be recorded. We don't record the one that's in person mm -mm. for a reason. Yeah, we want no proof. <laughs> <laughs> but we want free conversation. We're not going to record it. We are not going to allow anybody to record it. So don't think you can join in and record it. We're not mm -hmm. going to be happy about that. And we want you to attend just like you're here in person. Yeah. Well, the other part about recording is we we do talk about some sensitive things where yeah. you know you you might be not you but somebody there might be saying well our practice has a problem with xyz or we're not doing this or you know so we don't want that information to get out it's kind of like you don't want to do a a scan of your network and find all these issues and then have somebody just email that to you <laughs> <laughs> yeah like here's all the vulnerabilities you have and and just send it to you over an open document you know it's kind of yeah, not we something we want to be able to speak freely and not worry and just know that we intend to treat it as close to in person as we possibly can figure out. Mm -hmm. So go to thehippabootcamp.com <laughs> <laughs> to learn more and register. Yes, register today. And uh, we did uh, want to make sure that we that uh, we thank all the folks that uh, took the time to give us some good wishes after I posted on LinkedIn and the various social media sites that we were celebrating our fifth birthday. Did you do it like a TikTok dance video? No, but oh, okay. I promised you would. <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> but we got a lot of great messages on LinkedIn and, and Facebook, and it was really nice 
to feel that support from everybody out there. And then mm-hmm. we got uh, a, a really nice message just quietly sent to us by uh, one of our supporters, Ken Sims. Mm-hmm. He is, and he wrote this really nice message that was just awesome. So I wanted to shout out to him, thank him for his support. He's a donor. He's constantly uh, sharing information. And by the way, he he's not a HIPAA guy. <laughs> he, <laughs> he uses uh, our stuff for classes and stuff. So his message said, I shared your five-year birthday image on Facebook with the following comment. This is one of the few podcasts that I've listened to every episode of. Poor I didn't Ken. Get, huh? <laughs> Poor Ken. <laughs> it shows you right there he's not stable. Uh, well, <laughs> no. I can't help it that I have you on here. I didn't get started at the beginning, but I went back and downloaded them all to get caught up. Thanks for the reference, Matthew Christopher. So that's who must have sent it to him. Mm-hmm. P.S. It claims to be about HIPAA, but it's really about information security and common sense. And then he added at the end, and I spelled HIPAA right. <laughs> and I'm still no relation to David. Thanks and happy birthday. That's all right, Ken. You're still a Sims. <laughs> With See, one M. Yeah, he's not claiming it. That's, that's I know. I noticed that. It's like, no, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, but, but all you yeah. guys that uh, sent us messages and, and you know who you are, we communicate with you a lot. Um, thank you. And we, you're the reason we, I keep putting up with doing this. So <laughs> what, why do you say we, and then I, well, okay. If I quit, what happens? And then, um, I'll just be doing like, Hey, listen to a replay of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So thanks to everybody. It was, it was really touching some of the messages we got and, uh, and Ken's was one we couldn't see. So, uh, we couldn't say we like that or thanks on social media. So we wanted to do a shout out. to him. Yeah. Cause he tries to get all up in your personal inbox. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's enough of you we got a lot to cover all right let's go oh we're gonna take a break anyway i guess we will all right so listen to donna yap about stuff and we'll be right back two-thirds of small businesses that experience a cybersecurity breach end up closing their doors within six months cyber criminals are targeting your practice and coming after your most sensitive data Visit us online and schedule a time to talk about what you can do to protect yourself, your patients, and your practice. Our website is securityfirstit.com. That's securityfirstit.com. Does your business work with medical practices? As a medical practice business associate, do you realize that if you have access to patient information, you have to follow the same HIPAA rules as your client? Call Cardin today at 678-292-5001 so they can assess your privacy and security practices to help ensure you are protected and prepared. Visit CardinHQ.com to learn more. All right, we are back. So top 10 routinely exploited vulnerabilities came out from OCR, you know, rehashing the stuff from CISA. Well, they've never done that. And I thought it was kind of interesting. On May the 12th, CISA sent out this nationals, you know, through the National Cyber Awareness System alerts, Mm -hmm. the top 10 routinely exploited vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. I always have a problem with that word. (laughs) It sounds like Porky P. (laughs) That's all. So, (laughs) vulnerabilities. I'll never get it again, will I? <laughs> okay, so they made a point of saying that recently CISA at DHS issued an alert identifying these 10 cybersecurity vulnerabilities that are routinely exploited by foreign malicious actors. Mm-hmm. So then they shared it on their security list serve to and I thought this was in there. Raise awareness of vulnerabilities so organizations can take appropriate action. Mm-hmm. Now, 
we normally don't cover these things because they're very technical. Right. They, I mean, there's stuff that you could understand, but then it gets into these CVEs and I mean, it was a lot of stuff. Right. And that's usually not our gig, although maybe David could start one and then I would join. (laughs) But the important thing to note about what this release is, and I wanted to make sure that since OCR is bringing it up, that you know what to do with it. And they, at the beginning of this alert, there's a summary. And and they kind of tell you really what you need to know is this technical guidance to advise IT security professionals at public and private sector organizations to place an increased priority on patching the most commonly known vulnerabilities exploited by sophisticated foreign cyber actors. Mm -hmm. Basically, they're saying, look, with all the stuff going on with this virus, if you come up with the solution for it, you're going to get really, really rich. (laughs) Yeah. Right. There's a lot of greed involved. Number one. And number two, everybody wants to know what everybody else is really doing behind the scenes, not what they're saying out in public. Right. So there's a lot of spying going on. And I don't know when you, you know, when we, whenever we get into it with China, come on. I mean, they have entire buildings full of nothing but military hackers. So. They want you to use this list, and they're telling you that foreign cyber attackers, they're, they're exploiting publicly known, and this is their biggest point, often dated software vulnerabilities against broad target sets. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, they did come out and say they're after financial and healthcare repeatedly. Right. And they're basically begging IT people to do patching. because i mean they're hitting a lot of things that we know are a problem Mm -hmm. and that's what they're saying is that you know if if we did and i think they even say it in the a concerted campaign to patch these vulnerabilities i love this term would introduce friction into foreign adversaries operational tradecraft and force them to develop or acquire exploits that are more costly and less widely effective. And yeah, by the way, it would also help you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, pa- patching here, is, one of those, is one of those double-edged sword things, you know, because yeah. I mean, why every, nobody wants to do it. Yeah. Cause every, it's, it seems like every flipping day, but you know, certainly once a month you're seeing new windows patches, you know, causing all these issues or some other patch is crashing something else. And, and I'll tell you from an IT standpoint, every time we patch, even, even when we've tested it and whitelisted it, we still cringe. (laughs) Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen, but that's why they took this document and said, we're prepared for this. (laughs) Yeah. Here are the ones we're worried about. Just focus on these. And so to, when you try to ask your IT people, you you know, first of all, don't try to read the document. It's going to glaze over once you get past that first summary. Because when it says, for indicators of compromise and additional guidance associated with the CVEs in this alert, see each entry within the mitigation sections below. That means warning, do not read further unless you really want to know this. <laughs> yeah. But they do give you a really good list with very specific patches and why they want them done Mm -hmm. so you want to give your it folks whoever you use this list and you say i need to know if we have these installed or mitigated in some other way yep that's it make them make them tell you (laughs) right (laughs) that's a confidential answer i can't tell you can't tell you how we do it (laughs) yeah we just um you know we we had an episode of um a little bit back that we talked about, you know, choosing an MSP and, and kind of some differences. And, uh, you know, I like to talk about things that, you know, actually are happening in the real world. Uh, <laughs> but we, we recently brought on a client and they had an MSP that, that we displaced and they were running, you know, your standard tool. I'll just say it that way. The standard tools, the standard security stuff, yeah, you know, well known. Yep. It's, you know, 
and some of the some of the same tools that we use, not security tools, but some of the same management tools and all that. So very much your standard out of the box MSP. I would say ninety percent of of the MSPs out there doing the same thing. Went in uh, and and the funny part was they were like, no, we we uh, have been very happy with our service. We just need better security. And I was like, good for you. Uh, so we come in and we do our onboarding and we put all of our software and security on there and all that. And before we could done and leave the place, uh, we had four machines that had crypto miners running on them that were discovered. And yeah. so, you wow. know, here is just another example that just because you have IT, just because you have an MSP, just because you have standard security doesn't mean you're f- picking up anything. You know, mm-hmm. it's that's the part people don't understand is you have to have multiple layers of security these days. Antivirus is no longer good enough. You know, yeah, you don't get rid of it right now, <laughs> but you can have things that are higher that take the place of it and do the same thing, but do more. Right. And, right. Yeah. I mean, we still run antivirus, but we yeah. stack other stuff on top of it. I mean, that's, you know, it's the same analogy we've used many times before is you have to have, you know, uh, a padlock you know, on something. And then behind that, you have a, a bar that goes across the door and then you have, you know, a gun <laughs> or a dog or something, but you got multiple levels of either or things that alert or things that stop things from happening. And, uh, and you've got to have that digitally as well. Yeah. People need to realize that your network is, you should think of it as you're protecting bars of gold. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it, it is valuable to someone. Yeah. And the other as- aspect of it, and we talk about this all the time, is if, if you ask your IT provider, you know, what are you doing around security? And they go, well, we run XYZ antivirus or, or anti-malware, either one. If that's their answer and that's all the answer they, that you're getting, then that's a red flag because they should respond with, uh, we're following a security framework. And we're looking at these particular things. For example, this document we're talking about, mm-hmm. um, and we're addressing those things using tools that do X, Y, and Z or whatever. But it should be a, definitely a more thorough answer than we're using a piece of software or a whole bunch of buzzwords. Would, yeah, which is typically what you'll get. They'll try to talk over you or you know some other baffle kind of. them with BS. Yes. Yeah. So, but companies that or like David's company and the ones that we work with often should take this as a perfect opportunity to be proactive and provide the fact that this came out by CISA and DHS, give it to all your clients, whether they're healthcare or not Mm -hmm. and say, we've checked your systems for this. This is our opinion, or this is how you, you know, give them a report. And yep. say, this came out from the Department of Homeland Security. Everything's got to be dealt with. Here's our recommendations. Here's what we're doing. But handle it without people asking, and they're going to love you more. Yeah. So I highly recommend that you consider doing that. Yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to try to go into those technical details, which leads us to... Why this is about the new tactical crisis response guide. Mm-hmm. So it's HIC TCR, and I later saw HIC ticker, I think. So we got HICCUP, HICS Graham, <laughs> and HIC ticker. I love it. <laughs> I just love it. Yeah. I mean, we've been around HICS all of our life. <laughs> <laughs> A HIC chick. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think this guide is perfect. At the time that we're at, it's the fact that they were able to do this in the midst of this, that too is remarkable. So thanks, guys. Appreciate this to yeah, they're, everybody they're like, involved. We're all working from home with nothing to do. Let's come up with a guide. Yeah, it's mostly <laughs> folks that are doing IT at hospitals. So <laughs> they're not busy. Yeah, you know? not at all. <laughs> you know, and Eric's in Chicago. They're not busy. Yeah. But – This comes from the Healthcare Public Health Sector Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience Partnership, which gets us to HIC ticker because it's so much easier. The Health Industry Cybersecurity Tactical Crisis Response Guide. Yeah, no. (laughs) Not going to say it. But 
it is the same group that you know I work on the hiccup stuff with, and that's uh, everything's been set aside. I'm excited. We're getting back to that in July. Those of us that could have spent time, I personally was busy keeping a business afloat. I don't know you, David, but oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to help out, but I'm I'm ready to start trying to carve out that time again. But here is what the introduction to the document said, and it, it's clear statement, the reason that everyone should use this new guide. Everybody. Mm-hmm. And it really applies outside of healthcare. I don't right. Know. You want to read it? Sure. Oh. It clearly states, <laughs> uh, during a crisis, organizations need a tactical response for managing the cybersecurity threat that can occur. Uh, This document is constructed by industry and government experts to help guide through response activities. So small organizations can leverage this document as a list of activities to consider, while larger organizations can leverage this document as a sanity check (laughs) for existing plans. I did notice they didn't say anything about about medium organizations, so I guess you're just out. Yeah. (laughs) In either case, the level of risk and exposure to any organization is specific. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The activities listed here are suggestions to help with a practical and tactical response and are not intended to account for any given organizational incident response plan. Which they always have to say, don't just say I did this. I'm good to go. Mm-hmm. So, but, yeah, I mean, the fact it's suggestions. Yep. It can be used by small and large. And somewhere in there, we know the mediums will find their way. <laughs> but it can be used by everyone. and. It is not intended to just say, hey, wipe out everything you're already doing. Use this to make sure you're doing the right things and that things you haven't thought about you could cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a great idea. I think this also, as we get into it, you'll notice that we're not talking about throwing technology at the problem. No, most of it is not. (laughs) And I think that's where people get hung up is they're like, oh, we need security. So call IT in. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of (laughs) IT, obviously, but Uh we've got to get the message out that cybersecurity is not an IT problem. It requires everybody to be working together to even stand a chance. Mm -hmm. It takes us all. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But they later point out the importance of being prepared for a crisis because This was a perfect example where we have said before, you know, something happens over there, you're distracted. They're going to do this. That's why they attack on the weekends and holidays and at night Mm -hmm. while you're not paying attention. (laughs) As we record this, it's a holiday weekend. (laughs) I know. So you know some stuff's going to happen. Yep. But there's probably some stuff that's been sitting there for a period of time, Mm -hmm. and it's going to get launched. But. Anyway, they pointed out that during the COVID-19 crisis, these, uh, you know, they call them threat actors. Let's just say criminals, okay? It could be <laughs> the, or it's spies or criminals. I mean, that's that's what it is. And they leveraged the pandemic, and that's how they were able to throw out all this phishing and remote access and attacks on all kinds of things. And then, I love where they use I don't know about you, David, but for some reason, it seems like this word has suddenly, during this crisis, been haunting me. What's that? The efficacy. (laughs) Efficacy. It's suddenly like, why is everybody saying efficacy? Um, Because, you know, rarely (laughs) rarely can you use that in a sentence, so we're going to do it now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, Fauci uses it a lot. The efficacy hasn't been tested. Oh. Man, so sometimes I've now gotten to the point whenever somebody says efficacy, I repeat it. I feel like a you know brick on the <laughs> <laughs> the show in the middle. Efficacy, but the efficacy of these attacks was bolstered by the rapid change the health industry made in order to care for sick patients, deploy remote diagnostic and therapeutic treatments, and shift a large portion of its work source to workforce to work from home. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. So basically they're saying, look, the bad guys, while you were distracted and freaking out, 
they were using all their tools to get control, sneak in, steal your data. They were just very efficient and very effective yeah. in being able to attack. Yeah, Never let a crisis go to waste. Oh, right. <laughs> and we're always talking about threat landscapes, right? We say it's a constantly changing. Hello. Mm-hmm. Everything changed. Yep. It's, Overnight. It's, yeah. I mean, everybody's having to just, you know, we went from people that never even discussed in their practice using telehealth, telemedicine, whatever you want to call it, to we're up and running. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, there were so many things that were happening, and that's why we've talked about in our episode on reviewing your threat list. There's new vulnerabilities, new attack vectors, increased threat activity because of what's going on, and they call it a perfect storm-style scenario. Mm-hmm. Hello? All, uh, all systems blinking red for many reasons, but... I think that the best part was at the end of that summary where they said to thwart these attacks before they occur, it's essential for health organizations to establish, implement, and maintain current and effective cybersecurity practices. Hmm. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. I think we talk about it. You can't just have the policy and the procedure and not actually do it. (laughs) And you have to plan it and have people trained and you have to constantly review when something happens. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the common sense part Ken Sims was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know when they used uh, your name and common sense in the same phrase, I was like, I don't know. Hey now, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I got some sometimes, you know, but it, it comes and goes. But they did a really interesting approach, and they organized it into what they call four suggested areas of focus. Mm-hmm. And it suggests ways to do a self-assessment and how to use this, and, and gives you a lot of resources. So I think it's a, it, it was quite a brilliant way for making it into bites. So somebody that worries about this part, well, you just worry about those suggestions. You know, s- stay in your lane. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and you can almost you know divide these up into different parts of your organization as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can just assign each section to the team that takes care of it or the person. Or if you're like us, you just focus on one section at a time. Yeah. It's just, you know. Let's start with one. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so they do point out, and, and they're doing several things here, like we don't want you to use this to replace your – response plan yeah. and these are suggestions they're not requirements because <laughs> you know somebody's going to say well i'm not doing this the government's telling me to do this no it's not it's some experts <laughs> but it's not an exhaustive list mm-hmm. and again reiterating it's not a replacement for your response plan right so let's just make that clear from the beginning This is used to inform you and give you ideas for the plan you should already have or the plan that you should be building based on what's happened. True. I got it. Let's move forward. I don't want to hear any of that out of you. (laughs) What's this for again? (laughs) (laughs) So the four focus areas. Number one, education and outreach. All right. Who would have thought of that? I mean, you know, I don't know. It's like this whole thing about teaching people things is a new concept. (laughs) I just don't know. (laughs) Number two, enhance prevention techniques. Number three, enhance detection and response. And number four, take care of the team. Yeah. Doesn't that sound like Ipder? It does sound like Ipder. (laughs) All right, Peter. (laughs) (laughs) I like that better. Yeah, I know. But it, whichever one works for you, those are the functions for the NIST CSF. Yep. Hit them, Dave. Can you do it with the IPeter? IPeter. Uh, let's see. Identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Nailed it. Bam. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so basically, these are covering those topics. And giving you focus areas to consider for your plan. 
and they are not the be all end all, but there are certainly things that made me think about, you know what, I need to make sure that's happening with my clients or with our plan. I thought it was really, really cool. And that it gets down to take care of the team. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a quick review of what these are all about. The in prevention and detection response, there's areas that we spend a lot of techie time on. We'll hit those quickly, but when it comes to the education and outreach, I felt like, huh, should we start with education and outreach? We never talk about getting involved in educating people <laughs> around cybersecurity. No, not at all. Never, never uh, even talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> and in their little summary statement of the section, I love this line. The value of effective organizational education and outreach as a force multiplier cannot be underestimated. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of words to say. It is really, really good if you have your people prepared and they can communicate with each other. Yeah. So they don't screw up and they know what's going on. <laughs> well, you know, we always say that anytime you have a security incident in your organization, it's likely because somebody did something they shouldn't have done or somebody yeah. should have did something and they didn't do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it is absolutely a force multiplier for your protections. Having these people prepared and aware. Mm -hmm. That's a Better. good poster. I like that. Prepare and aware. Prepare and aware. There you go. Hey. Give me a t-shirt. I'm prepared I'm and aware. A, I'm going to have to figure something out. <laughs> You know, well, we should start doing it. You know, William Price has done a great job with our guide that we published in 2016 and 2017 with how to take the, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And mm -hmm. we created those little posters that people download. Yeah. And if you haven't downloaded them, they're out there. And yeah, they're old, but they still work perfectly. Mm -hmm. And now William's taken it and created the calendar carving system that he's teaching people to do with cybersecurity plans and small business. Thankfully, he constantly gives us credit. Thank you, William. Yeah. That's a way to wish we had thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a way to take the information and, and put it into action, not just internally, but turn it into something that uh, your customers and clients can use. Yeah. It reminded me I needed to review that in the boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, anyways. But so, in this education and outreach, I thought it was interesting that first they start with communication plans. Mm -hmm. And the number of times that we've talked to people and said that, oh, you know, you need to have a plan on how you're going to communicate with your people. And they're like, oh, well, we'll just call everybody. Yeah, no, that's not it. We need more than that. Mm -hmm. So in this discussion, they laid out what, five different plans that you need to have? Yeah. Five different communication plans. Yeah, most now, people don't have one. I know, right? Or they <laughs> think they have one, and when you start reading these things, you realize you really don't because they're like, you got to have various methods and channels for communicating with all these different groups based on the needs of each, What you know, it's the audience, the group, mm -hmm. what they need to know. And you get... Organizational leadership communication. How are they going to talk to each other and provide information out to the other groups? IT leadership communication plan. Clinical leadership. All users communication plan and external communication plan. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect breakdown. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do this already in our organization. Like yeah. we use Microsoft Teams. We used to use Slack, but when you look at the channels, it's broken down into the, there's a channel for the leadership. There's channel for the tech team. There's channel for the administrative team. So we break down the communication and then, you know, external communication with clients happens in a different platform in a different way, but we have all these communication channels broke down. Yeah. So whatever you're talking about, you go there. Yep. You want to know about, you go to that area, whether right. it's a room or a channel or whatever it's called, there's a million ways you can do this. Mm-hmm. And then I'll just talk to Donna through whatever means I can find. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. We got like 10. Let's, let's try. We'll hit them all. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that just the fact that any organization could take that one component, the value of that one component and having that level of preparation, even if the rest of it may fall apart, at least you can communicate it's falling apart. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can get everybody you need prepared or involved. Well, it makes it a little bit easier too, because you're not trying to solve all these different problems with communication with one solution because mm-hmm. how you communicate with the top level leadership may end up may be different than how you communicate with everybody else. And it certainly might be different than how you communicate externally. Right. And, and so trying to say, we're going to communicate with everybody this way. It might not, might not work that way. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you might be able to say, you know, if we have two people in our leadership team, we're going to communicate over telephone. That might work just fine, mm-hmm. but it might not work just fine to communicate that way with everybody else. And so you need a separate plan for all those. Well, and you need to remember, this was an absolute, hopefully once in a lifetime event. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, at least in my lifetime, I won't see that again. You know, I feel bad for my nephew. He was born literally on September 11th at like 8 a.m., 8 something. Oh, wow. Yeah. When the planes took off, he was being born. And then this was his graduation. <laughs> so all the kids that were born around that were graduating this year. So they were born into September 11th, suffered through the Great Recession. And now this is, you know, in when they were young. And then this is their graduation from high school. Wow. So everybody pay attention four years from now when all these kids are coming out of college. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the generation of the harbinger of evil. <laughs> <laughs> But it is important to note that in this event, when every company had to realize what if those people on your teams that are in charge were the ones that are on a ventilator in ICU. Mm -hmm. They can't communicate with you. You can't communicate with them. You don't know when you'll communicate with them. Yeah. You should include that in your considerations. Mm -hmm. Where's that policy manual? (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Don't put all of the eggs in one basket and put all the pressure on one or two people because they could be the ones that are impacted by the crisis. So that being said, they then go into, when I first saw it, I thought, policy and procedure review under education and outreach? I don't understand. But then I read the intro. (laughs) (laughs) How about reading it? (laughs) I skimmed it. (laughs) (laughs) But they said, consider that exceptional circumstances might pressure existing policy structure. Oh, yeah, it probably does. Like it just did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Though it is important for cybersecurity teams to be flexible with the organization, they also, at a minimum, must track these exceptions during any crisis to guide the organization back to normalcy once the crisis is over an informed continuous improvement process. Right. That whole part about track the, I mean, I don't know how many, I think every episode that we've had during this time frame, somewhere we've mentioned the importance of tracking what's going on. Mm -hmm. And in this area, you have to have the policy procedures. You have to have a plan for what you're going to do, but also that's where you're going to, train people and teach people. So the suggestions in there cover like 10 areas and it's legal compliance, IT teams working together so that the policies and procedures can be amended, updated quickly and document everything that's changed all at the same time. So those, these sections are very good at making you think about what you just went through and did you document those things and do you have a plan to do that in the future? Right. And the only way that you handle those two things is everybody knows what to do, which mm-hmm. would be the you know, education, educate yourself, educate your team, educate your community, educate your workforce. I mean, it's all in there. Yeah. Get educated. Educated. All right. So then section two, enhance prevention techniques. And that gets back to reduce the attack surface. Mm-hmm. We, that's a vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> a vulnerability management uh, term that we hear all the time. It, I'm looking at these notes and vulnerabilities in there like six times, and I'm like, I, I, I'm already struggling with it. <laughs> but <laughs> they do make a lot of sense. They have a, a section on limiting the attack surface, bolster remote access because you know you're going to need it, 
mm-hmm. and then leveraging threat intelligence feeds, which that is something that we got to do better at. But yeah. you got it's that's kind of tough for smaller organizations. But as the MSPs get more involved in security like you are, they're going to have to do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't as a small organization, you can't do that on your own. You've got to outsource that piece. Yeah. Cause that gets back to the OCR notice. Yeah. But you've got <laughs> the challenge always is though, when you outsource these things is, is it, is it really being done? Right. Because, Oh man, you can get me on a soapbox, but there's, there's just so many people that are just set it and forget it you know, kind of people and they're not doing these things. They're not paying attention. Yeah. And unfortunately, because there's kind of a mad rush toward cybersecurity for a lot of these IT people, they don't understand cybersecurity. They don't know it. They think they can just outsource it or just install the right, you know, XYZ tool and that's it. And and it's just going to cause a big problem for people to be able to shop for somebody who understands how to provide proper cybersecurity. It's going to get a lot harder. Yeah. Because they all think they know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't understand that. But you and I have talked about this before. I don't, yeah. I don't understand why specifically tech people have to dig in their heels and not be curious and not think that maybe I don't know. You know, there's things I know, but I'm always open to learn more. Yeah. Well, just, you know, when you talk about just leveraging threat intelligence feeds, I mean, this is yeah. just a matter of keeping up with things. And Yeah. You know, and this is why I actually had a conversation earlier this week. This person was asking me, you know, uh, if I if I got rid of X, Y, and Z, would it lower the price? And I said, look, there is so much that we do on the back end to make sure that we're even providing relevant security, not just security that works, but is it relevant? We have to do all these things to keep up with what's going on, to monitor these threat intelligent feeds and all that. And that's a massive undertaking. And, and that's, you know, yes, our prices are more than the guy that's coming in and installing stuff and say, see you next year. But but that's why, because you can't keep up with these things as a small business. You have to leverage it out to an IT provider and they have to be doing the work. And it takes a lot of work to keep up with this stuff. And by the way, the guide includes tons of resources on being able to do that. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing that you bring in your IT folks and say, which of these do you use? Yeah. And if they say none, then educate them. Get, look, there's nothing I would like more than for the IT community to start grabbing hold of this stuff and and, and doing things better for their clients. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, I, I'm all about education. Everything we do, clearly, you know, this effort is about nothing but education. It ain't about making money. Mm-hmm. But it is clearly important that we all be educated in our sectors and our portion it takes us all and that means all of us need to know what we need to know yeah i mean stop trying to provide minimum service to your clients you and your minimum 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 service service provider provider. yeah can't stand it because i see it all the time there are people out there pushing it i'm like why don't Mm -hmm. you tell your clients that you're providing minimum service to them (laughs) there you go all right so then we get on to number three enhanced detection and response now you know, this is the thing that you have to remember where we just talked about. You're going to be distracted. Mm-hmm. You're going to be making quick changes that could leave doors open. Right. And there has to be a way for you to know that's going on and prepare for it. Yeah. Because you've got, you can't assume you're not going to be attacked in a good situation. Yeah. So in a crisis, hello, it's going to be more likely. And it's the, quote always attributed to the criminal hacker that says you have to be right every time i just have to be right once to get in Mm -hmm. that's true yeah and you know you can have the best response in the world but (laughs) if your detection sucks (laughs) i know you don't know that we're ready we have no idea you're tearing the walls down but we're ready when we find out (laughs) (laughs) but they do make a point that that this is the section where you should be evaluating that your teams have the tools and capabilities now in advance of a crisis or know how they can get those immediately, like, boom, we need this, call this number, Mm -hmm. and have the authority to take those actions (laughs) in a crisis. Yeah. I mean, if you're trying to build the car while you're going down the road, that's kind of hard. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but that's what people do. They're like, we're going to put this thing together as we're driving. <laughs> yeah, true that. And it never works as well, does it? You know? <laughs> no. But you've seen plenty of Bubba's try to hold things on. It's like the people that run the string through the wind, uh, the car window so they can pull the windshield wiper. <laughs> windshield wiper, yeah. But, you know, yeah. honestly, if you look at it, that's kind of what we did as a whole is what we mm-hmm. did when we all went to work from home. It's like, right. hey, let's, you know, let's move everything to remote work and let's do it now on the fly. And so we basically were changing tires on a moving car. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it was like working in a pit crew and it, at at a minimum it was you know trying to do it some very complicated things that no one had made a plan for mm-hmm. you know those nascar people get that imagine your pit crew is everybody like who's doing tires as you're pulling in <laughs> yeah what do you mean who's doing tires who's doing tires who's doing gas yeah is anybody you know what you know and you're figuring it out as the car pulls up Mm-hmm. That's what you need to think of if you're a, a NASCAR person, a race person, is that that response and detection, you got to know when they need to come into the pit and be prepared that they're there Yeah. so that you can handle it. But they did a really good job. There's a ton of points in the area. A lot of it, again, is stuff that we've reviewed several times, but it does break it down so that you can see what's going on on your network. Mm-hmm. Because you know my line that I can't get to catch on. If you ain't looking, troubles cooking. <laughs> Have you ever seen the video of the? I think it was the Indy One uh, pit crew. They changed the tires on a car, and yeah. they well they changed. I, th- I think it was just a tire change, but it was all four tires. But they their pit crew is is so specifically trained that number one they did the whole thing in like five seconds, but number two you almost didn't see people move. Like they had things down to such a, a an efficient level that it was like you just saw people step forward and then step back and that was it. <laughs> it was wow. Like crazy, <laughs> but that you know that's what happens when everybody knows exactly what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, how they're supposed to do it, and they're and they're just a well oiled machine. Exactly. So, which kind of team do you want to have? The one where everybody's trying to figure it out. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know it, but again it goes back to preparation yeah so that's leads us to the last one which is taking care of your team and you know i'm sure that this one really was important and they learned a lot about that being pegged out and working non-stop and hours on hours on end mm-hmm. because often people especially you know we learn during this who's on your team, who who's your yeah. go-to people. Yeah. Every business learned the ones that are invested in being part of the team and making this happen, and they don't treat it like, hey, where's my paycheck? They treat it like I'm committed to what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I always said when I was getting people, young people working at those entry jobs and support and stuff, and I'd say, you need to figure out whether or not this is a job or career for you. Because if it's a job, we're going to teach you different things than if it's a career. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it does matter. And the folks that are the ones that are invested in doing their jobs and being part of the team, they're also the ones that are getting burned out. Oh, yeah. And guess what? They have personal responsibilities, too. Yep. And the thing about working from home is you don't have that divide before. Like, you know, you, yeah. there was, there was work and then there was home and, and there was a division oftentimes of driving and things like that. And so when you're working from home, it's like, you, you know, you just walk into another room and, it's a blur. and and there it is. And then you can walk out of the room and, and, and things start getting mixed. And so you have to be very careful about that. Otherwise you end up going, well, you know, I'm up at six o'clock and I know I don't have to be at work till eight, but let me go and get started. <laughs> right. And then, you know, nine o'clock at night. Oh, I, I need to get this done. And, you know, you're, if you're like me, that, you end up 16 hours in, in and you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> but we've always been that way. That's <laughs> I know. <laughs> but in, in this, they do make the point that you also have the other side of that is the people that have to stay at work and never go home. Mm, yeah. You know, one of the success stories 
here locally that's been on like they were interviewed by People Magazine and USA Today and all these other folks is the Park Springs community, the senior living community. It's one where you move in and it has everything from, hey, I just retired to assisted living and through the whole thing. It's nearby here. They shut down in March and no one has left and returned. I mean, no one comes and goes. The, into all of the employees have stayed there hmm. and have continued to stay there to protect those patients. And they've had a couple of people that were tested positive. They immediately would remove them and isolate, but it involves testing and all of those kind of things. And they have been super successful because they made that sacrifice. But think about those people, the mm-hmm. employees and the residents. If you are on the team and you aren't the one that has to stay there and not go home, then volunteer to do stuff to help their families. And that's what I learned at Hurricane Irma and being in Key West. And it there's a lot to worry about at home. Yeah, yeah there is. You, know, they, you help your neighbors, but you also, everybody has a role on the team if they're willing to participate. Oh, yeah. There's plenty of work to be done. Well, even just supporting people because worrying about the team. But you need to have that plan, and they they made it clear, the importance of doing, quote, an honest and pragmatic assessment mm-hmm. of the organization's capabilities is essential. Now I got to go look up what pragmatic means. Oh, Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go with exacerbate again. I know. Who's that, uh, Alex? Uh, Alex. <laughs> Am I, I exacerbating this, David? <laughs> no. Uh, and he misspelled it just it, until you read it, and then he goes and changes it. I love it. I know. I, I uh, love that. I love that our listeners poke at me, so that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't think I haven't gotten emails from like, what? <laughs> Especially Alex. He's a hoot. Yeah. Anyway. But. I think it's important that everyone take the time to read through this, no matter whether you're planning for yourself, your clients, your family, your business. It is absolutely essential that we start to consider these things after what we've seen. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think I'll take it into the bathroom and read it today. (laughs) I can hear Lori now. (laughs) It's the only place you can get quiet around here. (laughs) Yeah, We always called it, uh, my grandfather always said it was the library. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. What are you doing in there so long? I'm reading. <laughs> yeah. No, when they would say, where, where, where's Pa? And he, they, oh, he's in the library. <laughs> he's the smartest man you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he always had something. Yeah. Sure that. Indeed. All right. So, good guide, right? Yes. Excellent guide. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Cool. All right. Well. Thanks again to uh, Eric Decker and the team for listening to the podcast and giving us more fodder to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. Also appreciate uh, Ken Sims again. Uh, thanks for the the email and and obviously the, being a donor. Many thanks for that and uh, all that good stuff. So that is our show for today, folks. Remember to follow us and share us out on your favorite social media site. Rate us on our podcasting app. Keep helping us spread the word. Get the word out there. You know, because uh, even though you know we say we talk about HIPAA, apparently we don't. <laughs> it's all about common sense and stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Help me with common sense. That's the new name. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, you know, but common sense is not so common. We know, we know that. We do. <laughs> but anyway, for Donna and myself, remember that HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.